Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us for Direct Connection. We begin tonight with what you need to know about preventing and treating skin cancer. Joining us in the studio for our Your Health segment this week is Dr. Zainab Maksumi, the Assistant Professor of Dermatology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, also a dermatologist at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Doctor, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. This is a perfect time of year to be talking about sun-related conditions and, and skin cancer clearly is one of those. Absolutely. The, the time is here. And um, no better time than, than the beginning of the summer to talk about skin cancer and, and um, how prevalent it is, really. And we'll, we'll focus on prevention, but I think the way we can get people focused on the importance of prevention is to talk about what you do. You're in a specialty called Mohs surgery, which I, I it's right. not nose surgery. No, it's not nose. It I be. have been called a nose surgeon, <laughs> but I do Mohs on the nose. A lot of times. So where, did it's the, where did the phrase come from? It's M O H S. It's M O H S. It's actually uh, named after Dr. Fred Mose, Frederick Mose, who who described and pioneered this technique when he was uh, at the University of Wisconsin in I think 1940, 1941. He first described this technique. He was um, I think a medical student, which makes me feel. Very, very so, so behind, somebody but. comes to see you, they've mm -hmm. been diagnosed with a, a skin cancer mm -hmm. or lesion of some sort. What do you do that's different from what a dermatologist might do in their office? Right. Good question. So, you know, the beauty of what I do, the beauty of what I do as a Mohs surgeon is that it's a really comprehensive technique where I serve not just as the surgeon, but as the pathologist. So if you went to a dermatologist and they cut out a skin cancer and they sent it to the pathologist, um, the pathologist kind of bread loafs the section and they're looking on average at about 0.03% of that margin. Bread, bread loaf meaning slice, slice, slice. Meaning just kind of slice it exactly, sort of like a loaf of bread. Um, what I do is, is completely different. I actually look at a horizontal margin where I'm looking at 100% of that tissue margin. So as opposed to 0.03%, there is not one portion of that tumor margin that gets beyond my eye under the microscope. So kind of the, the, the cutting is the, the least of what you do, it sounds like. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the cutting is, well, and the, and the putting back together is definitely the fun part of what I do. But really, the, the, the beauty and the continuity of what I do is that when I take out the skin cancer and I walk it to the lab, I take off my surgeon hat and I put on my pathologist hat and I look under the microscope and I map and I see are there tumor buds here, are there tumor buds there, and if not, I call it clear. If there's tumor there, then I map exactly is it at the 6 o'clock or the 9 o'clock and I go back and I take a little bit more and I repeat that process until I have decided that the tumor margins are clear. And then I sort of put my my reconstructive surgeon hat on, and I decide how how to close how to close that defect. In, in the meantime, what's going on with the patient? He or she is sitting in the waiting room They're, with a mm -hmm. kind of a hole somewhere. No, no, not <laughs> it's not that gruesome. They're actually usually across the street. We have a great deli across the street from where my practice is, or they're watching TV in the waiting room, or they're they're sitting and talking with their family members with a bandage on there. So definitely not kind of walking around with holes, not stopping traffic. When, when, when does uh, a regular old dermatologist decide this one needs to go to the Mohs surgeon? Really good question. So um, there are all these indications for Mohs surgery, all these kinds of scenarios where that patient ends up in my office. And really the most common reason they end up is location, right? Location, location, location. It's that old adage, real estate. So, you know, really prime real estate's going to be from the neck up. So anything from the neck up it really essentially is going to be most surgery appropriate. So that's probably the most common reason the dermatologist sends the patients to me. There are a whole host of other factors. Most commonly, um, patient characteristics. If that patient is especially sick, if they have a transplant, I have a lot of patients I care for at university with transplants. They are really vulnerable population. So a tumor anywhere on a transplant patient and they're coming to see me for Mohs. Um, and then I'm sorry. And I was going to say really big skin cancers. You know, a skin cancer on the back that's less than two centimeters doesn't cause a problem, but bigger than that. And you're, you're going to want Mohs. And uh, bigger than that would be, is, is that fairly uncommon? It is, yeah. I would say most commonly uh, with regular dermatologic checkups, most people can, can catch skin cancers well under two centimeters. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and do, do you tend to see, I mean, there's different grades. There's the squamous, squamous cell. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and then at the other, other end of the spectrum is the melanoma. It, the less virulent cancers, do they go to a Mohs surgeon as well? Really good question. I would say that 80% of what I do is basal cell skin cancer, which is overwhelmingly the most common skin cancer. There's over 2.5 million cases in the U.S. every year. So most commonly, I'm seeing basal cell. Um, and then second most common, I see squamous cell skin cancers. Melanoma, which is definitely the most virulent, and that's the one we all worry about metastasizing to other parts of the body and really eventually ultimately causing death. Those I don't do most surgery on. Those we're going to do standard excision, and we take pretty wide, wide margins off of those. Right. Let me uh, remind our viewers, if you have a question about uh, dermatology in general, skin cancer in particular, give us a call. We'll have the number up on the screen. You can also tweet a question. Our Twitter address is at MPT News. So now that we've done the gruesome description of the <laughs> surgery that happens if you get one of these, how do, how do we not get skin cancer? And, and are they all preventable? Very good question. Most skin cancers are preventable. When you look at the, the percentages, it's about 90% of these tumors, that skin cancers, that we can directly attribute to ultraviolet radiation, whether that's indoor tanning or outdoor, good old laying on the beach, sun exposure. Most skin cancer is directly attributable to ultraviolet radiation. And so, you know, the most important thing you can do to prevent skin cancer and prevent ending up, you know, in my office, uh, is, is just to protect yourself from the sun. You know, it's, it's practice safe sun, as I tell my patients. If, if, if you know you're going to be outside between the hours of 10 and 4, cover up or, or seek shade. Um, you know, you have to live your life, which is what I tell my patients. I'm realistic. I know you're going to be on a beach. You're going to be on the eastern shore. Just be smart about it and seek, seek shade and apply sunscreen. Um, most, can, okay. can, you, can you get sun, sun cancer in a place that the sun doesn't reach. That the sun don't shine on, yeah. <laughs> Maybe your underarms or someplace uh, Absolutely. Where, where you wouldn't expect it. You can, you can. They're much more rare. Um, those types you can get caused by a virus. Some viruses can cause skin cancer. Overwhelmingly, though, it's the sun-exposed areas that tend to see the brunt of skin cancer. And, and, you know, you just look at the face. Well, most of the Mohs surgery I do is on the nose, and the nose, you know, sticks out to the sun the farthest. So most skin cancers are going to be sites that are hit by the sun. I'll tell you about my experience as a lifeguard. And there, there was no sun. Well, this is a long time ago, but even that zinc oxide stuff, mm -hmm. you still get a sunburn. If you're sitting out there all day. Right. Yeah. And you have to reapply. And that's yeah. something, you know, people say, well, I, you know, I put on SPF 20 at eight o'clock in the morning. But when I got home at five o'clock from fishing on the bay all day, I had a burn. And yeah. so, you know, you have to reapply. I tell yeah. my patients every two hours. That's my rule. And get a big hat. And a, a wide brim hat. Let's Absolutely. Uh, take a phone call. This is Bob in Baltimore County. Bob, thank you for calling. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm an older person who has had uh, several skin cancers. And I'm wondering about the timing of all this. As a kid, I got severe burn, sunburns. And I don't know if that projects forward, but also the dermatologists nowadays say, at my, even at my age, I should protect myself from sun. And I wonder how old exposure and, and recent exposure uh, uh, go together. Bob, we got it. Thank you so much for the phone call. Yeah. So, so I, I think what Bob's saying is that if, if um, his exposure to the sun 40 years ago caused this problem today, does he really have to worry about today's exposure Going projecting way out right. in the future? Yeah, it's a good question, and it's a question I get a lot. And I, I tell my patients to wear sunscreen. I tell my 80-year-olds to wear sunscreen. And I tell them to wear sunscreen not for today or tomorrow, but for five or ten years from now. We consistently see about a five- or ten-year lag between sun exposure and the development of skin cancer. And, and to answer Bob's original question about sunburns, oh, absolutely we know that sunburns are directly linked to the risk for melanoma. Having one sunburn as a child doubles your risk for melanoma. But who didn't have a sunburn? Is right. it, how do they do that study? Right, I know, yeah. that's true. Yeah, absolutely. And people didn't know back then either, so. How about the different kinds of sunscreen? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of different brands, and mm -hmm. some say broad spectrum, some say UVA, UVB. 
Right. I don't know what else. Bro- yeah. <laughs> That's good. Broad spectrum. Broad, definitely always go with the broad spectrum sunscreen. You're going to want to cover UVA and UVB. And in terms of the number, everyone is so focused on the number. And what do I do? Do I use 35 or 40 or 25 or 30? And I just tell people, it's not the number. I mean, as long as you're above 35 or 40, I promise the number is fine. It's the fact that you're reapplying every couple hours. You can put on SPF 85 in the morning. And if you don't reapply, then you are going to get color. You're going to get burned and you're going to get the radi- the UV radiation. Are, are we sure these things prevent skin cancer? Obviously, you know that if you put the stuff on and you go hang out at the Preakness and you don't get a sunburn, that it, it prevented the sunburn. Is it is, is it the same mechanism? Is it possible that, that certain rays of the sun, sun are still, you know, damaging your, your skin cells? Good question. And absolutely, the data is there. The data is there that sunscreens are proven to reduce the incidence and the aggressiveness of skin cancers. Let's talk to Lee in Prince William County, Virginia. Lee, thanks for calling. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to say, I was talking about like skin cancers and uh, the sunshine and stuff like that. It's like years ago, I think we used to be more of a farming community from a few years ago. And how does how is it different now than it was back then? I just wanted your opinion on that. I didn't quite catch the first part. Uh, years ago, we were more of a farming community, and people, I think, were out in the sun, exposed a lot more. And you're saying they didn't get as many skin cancers? I don't know. I was just wondering. Okay, what that's a, right. That I, I, I understand. I mean, it's, it's part of it that people live longer. Right. Good question. And a lot of people are asking me, well, the incidence, the increased incidence we're seeing, is it because... There are more most surgeons, there are more dermatologists, and we're just picking up a lot more and we're being more vigilant. And the truth of the matter is, no, it is a true increased incidence. Even if you say that we're just picking it up more and we're more aware, when you look and you stratify out for that increased vigilance, there is still a true increased incidence in, in skin cancer. It has to do with the ozone layer. It has to do with the thinning you know, of the, the protective layer we had. So, no, there is a true increased incidence in skin cancer we're seeing. Is, is a tan protective in, in some way? So I'm thinking people, maybe right. maybe there wasn't good sunscreen. The stuff, you know, when I was a kid, this, it was intended to make you more tan, not to prevent the, the sun from, from getting through. Did, did that, when, when in the summer, especially more people working outdoors, maybe... They, they were better protected. Right. And that's a question I also get a lot. People are preparing for a beach trip and they say, oh, can I just go ahead and get a quick tan to go ahead and provide me some protection as a as a base so I don't burn? We now know that that's absolutely not true. The 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 direct cause of skin cancer is cumulative exposure, cumulative ultraviolet radiation. Every tan you get every 15, 20 minutes you're out in the sun that's just increasing and adding to your risk for skin cancer. And when that gets beyond a certain threshold, you're going to start developing skin cancers. Yeah. And, and if that's not enough, it makes you look wrinkly. Uh, no one <laughs> wants to look like t- old leather. That's right. Uh, let's talk to Kim in uh, Baltimore County. Kim, thanks for calling. Go ahead. Oh, you were talking about this Mohs procedure mm-hmm. as opposed to testing certain parts of the tumor. Is Am I understanding that correctly? Where you do the Mohs, you, you test the... 100% of the tumor? <clears throat> That's correct. That's right, Kim. Yeah. When I when I remove the tumor by the Mohs technique, I walk that tissue to the lab and I have my technician slice it, stain it, and I look under the microscope at 100% of that margin, both the peripheral and the deep margin. Now, could the patient specify that that's what they want to have done or is it something that is only the decision of the doctor? Great, great question. I'll get you the answer on the air to that. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, there are certain indications for Mohs surgery and we sort of have to go by by those indications. And that's a function of of, you know, the healthcare system as a whole. That's insurance companies and looking at the cost benefit analysis and, and the cure rates. The cure rate I can get with Mohs surgery is about ninety nine point two percent. With standard excision, you're looking at a 92% cure rate. So for the the back or the arm, it's not the trade-off. You just take a little bit wider of a margin, and it's fine. Really, it's when you're getting to the prime real estate areas that you need that precision. You need that accuracy. I know you're enthusiastic about the surgical treatment of of skin cancer. Are there non-surgical treatments? 
There absolutely are. And for the more, you know, uh, superficial skin cancers, definitely Mohs is not the only way and it's not really the appropriate way to treat them. Very superficial skin cancers we can treat in the office with uh, curatage where I just take uh, almost what looks like an ice cream scooper and I scrape the top of that uh, skin cancer. I can also use liquid nitrogen, which is kind of a cold spray that you spray on, yeah, and those are sort been of... Been there, right. Yeah, been there, been frozen that's before. That's say we're going to freeze it off or we're going to burn it off. Exactly, and that's what they're talking about. And what I'm referring to is the more aggressive skin cancers. Okay, let's talk to Gail in Baltimore City. Gail, thanks for the call. Go ahead. Yes, I have two questions about um, getting sunburn. Uh, uh, one through, through car windows and also uh, porous clothing and what effect that would have on skin cancer. Thanks very much. Really good question, Gail, because a lot of people assume that window glass filters out the ultraviolet. We now know that that's, that's really only part of the story. There are still UV rays that can go through window glass, and so you still need to be careful when you're driving and you need to wear sunscreen. You can even put the visor down on that left side while you're driving. So, you know, you definitely s still need to be careful. And I believe Gail's second portion was about porous clothing. Uh, truthfully, there, there are sunscreened clothings. There are a lot of companies out there making sunscreen clothing. Unless you're buying one of those, the truth is there is going to be some sunlight and some ultraviolet radiation that seeps through, seeps through the clothing. You brought up tanning beds uh, earlier in the conversation. Is there something about that that makes it even more dangerous yeah, it's sort of, it's the same ultraviolet radiation, but it's, it, you're being exposed under the, those light bulbs and really just diffusely everywhere. And the, recently the WHO, the World Health Organization came out and, and actually classified, um, tanning beds as a group one substance. So that's the most dangerous cancer causing agents they put plutonium, I think, and cigarettes in that group. And so tan, yeah, tanning beds are right up there. So, absolutely unsafe. Continuing our conversation with Dr. Zainab Maksumi of the University of Maryland on the topic of skin cancer prevention and treatment. If you have a phone call for us, you have a question, give us a call. We'll have the number up on the screen. I did want to ask about research in, in this area. I'm sure there's research going into the, the newest, the best sunscreen. In terms of diagnosis and, and treatment, what, what are the exciting areas? Yeah, really good question. There are a lot of new um, computer models that have been coming out that uh, look to diagnose melanoma, that look to diagnose basal cell, basically just by taking an image. So you sort of hold your iPhone up there. No and kidding. It, just like you take a selfie, right? You take a selfie of the, the, the skin cancer and, and the computer models can kind of analyze that based on some algorithm that they have and basically tell you suspicious, not suspicious, biopsy, don't biopsy. And, and truthfully, I have not, I, I still find that the, the good old, my good old eyes are probably the best in my clinical judgment. So I don't use those in my practice, but I know there's a lot of research that's going into these new um, picture and um, uh, computer models. How much of it is a judgment call? Is it a subjective look by a, a trained practitioner uh, saying, yeah, that doesn't look good. I don't, I don't like the way that looks yeah. v versus you know, some objective standard. There are definitely objective standards I use, and I, and, and I tell my patients at home because they're only seeing me, you know, once every three, four months for my, my regular uh, dermatology patients, and for Mohs, they're already diagnosed. So what I tell my patients is really, you know, for melanoma, it's the ABCDs. You want to you wanna look for any asymmetric mole, um, any mole that has irregular borders, any mole with uh, color variations, and any mole with a diameter greater than six millimeters, and, and using those ABCDs criteria, if any mole fits that, then, then they need to and be on the phone with me. Fr frankly, the, the, the picture of that that they have sitting in the dermatologist's office, you, you wouldn't need a medical degree to right. say, I, I got to get that thing looked right. at. But, it, but sometimes it's, it's more of a judgment call. It, absolutely. That, that's true. And a lot of my patients, I, I guess I'm pretty fortunate. I have really smart patients um, and, and they know, they know that if a spot comes up and it's painful, that's a trigger. Skin cancer grows around nerves. And so if there's pain from a spot, that could signal that it's a skin cancer. Anything that's bleeding, my patients know to call me with a bleeding spot. And so I have very, very intelligent patients who, who sort of have been through this before, so they know what to look for. Let's uh, take another call. This is Bob in Baltimore City. Bob, thanks for calling. Go ahead. 
Hi there, my name is Raul from Bowie, and I want to ask a question. Okay, you're on. Go ahead, Raul. Well, thank you very much. I had a question, and it was um, it, it regarded getting into a tanning bed and smashing my apples. <laughs> I don't know where that was going. I think we covered tanning beds pretty uh, so. pretty conclusively there. So on the dermatology front, the the, the idea that that um, some things require maybe a closer look. Do, do people at a certain age need to go in once a year, even if there's no, they don't have any history, they don't have a family history? Absolutely. And, and you know, just like you would change your oil, just like you take your car to get your oil checked, you still need to get a skin check. And, and anybody really over the age of about 50 or 55, just like they see, you know, the mechanic once a year, they need to be seeing a dermatologist once a year just, just to get a checkup, make sure that one of us says you're good to go, uh, you know, until next year. Or if something changes, call us before. Frankly, dermatologists can be some of the, the hardest medical specialists to get appointments with. And in, in my experience, just a little bit around town, uh, yeah. populations aging. There's there's a lot of people who, who need to get looked at. Um, what, what's your advice there? And, and we're practices have a physician assistant, how, how comfortable should somebody be in, in seeing the PA as opposed to an MD? Absolutely, Jeff. That's a question I get a lot. And, and, and it really, you know, it depends. We have a physician assistant in our practice and she's fantastic. And, and, and that's sort of the message I've been getting from, from other friends of mine who have that same model. And it just depends with, with how comfortable how comfortable you are. In terms of getting in to see a dermatologist, you know, it can be tricky, it can be difficult, but, you know, it's just a matter of, you know, being persistent. And if really a spot is worrying you and you have a bleeding a bleeding spot, then that absolutely has to be evaluated by, and, by right. someone. And your regular doctor may be able to help grease the skids, get you in some place. On, on the subject Definitely. of the physician assistance, though, it's an interesting thing because um, I mean, they specialize more than anybody, and that's all they do, mm -hmm. really, is, is look at bumps and things, and in some ways, they, they probably have more expertise in it than the family doctor. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, like I said, the physician, physician assistant we have, this is all she does, and so absolutely, I trust her implicitly. I trust her clinical judgment. I trust her skills, and so it, it really just depends, I think, on, on the situation. And bottom line on Mohs surgery, uh, stay away from it if you can, but if you need it, you, you, if, you need it. If you need it, you need it, and we're not, we're not so bad. We're pretty nice. That point was, uh, was proven tonight. Dr. Zainab Maksumi, University of Maryland Medical Center, University of Maryland School of Medicine, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.